some of the things I feel strongly about. Let's see if you can, gu can guess why. <laughs> I'm a researcher. Um, <clears throat> Like Google is really great and I Googled my symptoms and decided I had PCOS and I went to the gynecologist ready for that PCOS um, diagnosis. And then so she did a full hormone panel. I was like, it's not that, but you need to go see a, an endocrinologist because it's something pointing to the brain. So I went back on Google and then decided I had Cushing's or acromegaly um, based on the symptoms that I had. So <clears throat> it's a really great resource, but um, right now, I don't know, you hear about a lot of bad stories of, of things that people are being told to do and told not to do, um, medicines to take and not to take. Um, Stories about someone's brothers, sisters, uncles, aunt who you know something terrible happened to ten years ago. Um, some of it could be true. It could all be true. It could all be false. But the whole point is, we have re you know, medical research. We have doctors who are experts in this. They go and present to other doctors. They're sharing this information. Doctors are getting the education. It's getting better. It's not as bad probably as you've heard. It's not as good as I might like to think it is. But just be careful out there. <laughs> Um, and if something sounds kind of, hmm, that sounds like a crazy story, just you can, most of the stuff you can also go on Google and look it up and find something on PubMed or something from an educational or scientific background to um, base your decisions on, or you can, you can be a researcher. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so I'm gonna introduce Dr. Uh, Nelson Oyesiku. I'm trying not to cry. Um, this is my neurosurgeon. Fuck. Okay, uh, and <clears throat> so, the picture on the left was in September of 2014. He was receiving the Gentle Giant Award. Was it PNA? I don't remember. Um, so I came and I made a button with his face on it and I thought it was all better and I was like, yeah, I'm so great now. I feel great. I don't have Cushing's. I'm not sick and dying. But I still, like, when I saw the picture, I remember thinking, cool, I look awesome. I'm so happy with the progress that I've made and I feel like I don't even look like I have Cushing's anymore. But, I mean, I did. So the other picture is last night. And so I like, couldn't wait, I like, made him like, stay in a position so that I would be like, he'd be on the left and I'd be on the right. <clears throat> and I didn't even try, I was just like, I'm just gonna stand here like normal and then just take the picture and see what it looks like, kind of like I did on the left. And I'm just like so happy with the difference and it's been a long journey and some of you guys have had even worse cases than mine. And um, I don't know, making, having a good surgeon, having a good team makes a huge difference. Like I don't think I would be up here talking if I had not had access to a, a center of excellence here at Emory because I had a lot of complications, and if I had had to wait while my doctors tried to fax, um, you know, amongst practices, you know, Piedmont and this and that, uh, it would have, I, I couldn't have afforded a delay. So I'm pretty happy anyway. Um, so I would like to introduce Dr. Nelson Oyesiku, Oyesiku. Um, and he's gonna talk about <laughs> physical and chemical changes of the brain and heart in Cushing's. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Leslie, for not just that introduction, but the tremendous efforts you made to um, work with the CSRF and put on this wonderful conference. And the attendance is indeed great. Um, the, the best um, testimonials are those that come from your, your own patients because they know best. They, they walked in those shoes. And um, so thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Leslie wanted me to talk on the physical and chemical changes um, that uh, we see in the brain and the heart and the vessels with Cushing. So I'm going to do that. It's an hour-long talk, and I think it's that way because there's uh, opportunity for questions and, and, and that sort of thing. And it's actually more time than I need, so I asked Leslie's permission to given what we talked about yesterday afternoon, late in, late in the afternoon, about some of the surgical issues, strategy techniques, and that sort of thing. I'll devote maybe seven or eight minutes to that after I finish talking about this, so that way you'll see maybe in some in real time with some videos and pictures what, we, what, what we're talking about. Um, okay, so um, most of what I will say about this, you will know better than I will, because why? You experienced it. And it'd be like bringing coal to Newcastle. Um, 
because I'll be telling you things that you have seen and felt and experienced and said to people and sometimes the message gets through and sometimes it doesn't, but you know what you feel. Uh, so I'm here at Emory, just uh, uh, up, up the street, if you will. Um, Dr. Wakimescu, who you met, met, met uh, yesterday, who gave the talk on Centers of Excellence, is my co-director of the Pituitary Center there. And this is virtually all I do, um, except breathe and eat. Um, um, and um, so, and uh, in the back there, I think was Lisa Ward, uh, PA, who you may also have met. So I have no disclosures uh, or conflicts of interest. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, the clinical presentation, some of the cardiovascular and brain manifestations, and the effects of treatment on those, and then long-term prognosis. And then, as I said, we'll seg into the second bit. So, okay, uh, painful to repeat because you already know, but I, uh, it, it has to be said. The fundamental uh, issue here is too much cortisol. Cortisol is not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing when you need it, um, but too much of it is, is bad for you like most things. Um, it's caused by an ACTH secreting tumor, which causes the endogenous hypercortisolism, which drives the adrenal to do that. Um, you know it's rare, it's about 40 per million. So in Atlanta, we have a population of 6.9 million or whatever, call it seven. So if you do the math, uh, that's seven times, that's 280 cases prevailing, okay? That's, that's the no total number of patients in that population based on that. The number of new cases is three to five per million. So if you do the math on that, the number of new cases is just roughly under 30 cases a year. So it's not everything, it's not the kind of disease that everybody in your neighborhood and your church is gonna come up with. It's, it's rare, as you already know. Which explains to a greater extent, a very great extent, why people get mystified, because it's something, it's like something that people don't care about, know about, even physicians, you know, card-carrying MDs and so forth, don't run into, and sometimes may never run into in their whole career. So when you worry, worry about how long it takes to make the diagnosis, that's one of the fundamental reasons why. Uh, fun, um, most cases of excess cortisol are not due to people popping uh, cortisol pills uh, or the adrenals. Uh, safely to say that over 80% of them are due to a, s a small tumor lodged in the pituitary gland causing uh, uh, called Cushing's disease as you see in that cartoon there. Um, let's see, did I go the wrong way? Yes. So features, hypertension, which is a cardiovascular, um, has a cardiovascular basis to it, too much sugar, hyperglycemia, and the personality and the cognitive changes, and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're gonna talk mostly about the cardiac and the brain changes. So the cardiac changes, um, hypertension fundamentally, uh, hyperglycemia also uh, affects the blood vessels, the microcirculation and so forth. And the personality cognitive changes are due to underlying changes in the brain as a result of hypercortisolism. The other things, I'm very important as they are, things like moon faces, hirsutism, buffalo hump, purple stria, which have major uh, body um, um, uh, implications for um, uh, body appreciation by the patient are not obviously relevant to the brain and the cardiac changes. Then the osteoporosis and immune suppression, very important too, uh, but themselves are not cardiac or brain related. So in the brain, uh, if you look at the brain in cross section, it looks like a walnut, right? It looks like a walnut. It has these ridges and furrows in it. And uh, those ridges and follow furrows are called the sulci and the gyri. And the reason for that is to pack as much volume of nervous tissue into that cavity called the cranium. So it's very important that the brain is very wrinkled and convoluted and densely packed. What you don't want is a brain that is look, looks like the one you see in the picture where the, the, the uh, brain looks like it's shrunken and um, um, and uh, most of that shrinkage takes place in the what's called the prefrontal cortex. In other words, the front part of the brain where you have things like executive function, judgment, decision making, uh, and, and those kinds of things, analysis, uh, and 
Um, it turns out that cortisol uh, has significant uh, impact on the, on the brain. Uh, and that leads to changes in executive function, learning, memory, and verbal skills. And it's not made up. Um, it's, you know, if somebody hasn't heard about it or knows about it, a physician, even the physicians uh, don't know very much about this. And so it's hard to make the connection. And you may be suffering from this and trying to make uh, the case for why things are not the way they should be. Uh, but again, uh, just to go back to the point of uh, what I said earlier on, not a lot of people know about this. And then if that were not enough, it also affects your overall psychological, psychiatric makeup, primarily with mood disorders. Cortisol is, you know, a very powerful hormone, and uh, you've all heard about the flight or fright, uh, flight or fright response, which explains why anxiety and, and psychosis, neuroses, depression, mania, um, uh, insomnia, uh, are all major changes in in Cushing's. Uh, Cushing's disease or hypercortisolism for any, any reason. And then your memory, which is not in the prefrontal cortex, it's mostly in the hippocampus and the amygdala, a different part of the brain, that part of the brain that's in, in blue in the lower, in the lower uh, figure there is called the amygdala and the hippocampus, and that is a vital area for encoding new memory, yeah, and also in initiating long-term memory. So both components of memory can be and do get affected. So it's, you know, it's a double whammy. You're getting hit up here, and then you're headed, getting hit at the base of the brain, all from this. And uh, it's been studied in the laboratory in, uh, in, in, in animal models, and it's also been studied in, 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 in humans using sophisticated imaging techniques such as MRI scans, CT scans, and PET scans. And what you see there is that the cells actually, you actually lose neurons. They go away, they shrink, and some of them go away, and some of them don't come back. And that's called atrophy. In other words, that aging senescence or the um, uh, process that we see in normal aging, but is accelerated as a result of the hypercortisolemia. And both animal models, like in primates, for example, and clinical studies in humans corroborates both of that. Well, the same atrophy that happens in the hippocampus also happens in the prefrontal cortex. Remember, we said the front part of the brain uh, where a lot of the uh, higher cortical functions are lodged, um, that also is affected by the, by, the, by the same process. If you see that, look at that MRI scan, you can see the wrinkles in the brain. Uh, and this is not an 82-year-old, this is a 32-year-old. And they're not meant to have brains that look that shrunken. It's kind of thing that you see in ad, you know, cases of advanced dementias and that sort of thing. The mechanism, the reasons why you get the atrophy, are a lot, a lot, of, a lot of reasons why. One of them is because the, the hypercortisolism leads to decreased ability of the nerve cells to use and, 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 and imbibe glucose. And of course, glucose is a very powerful driver of the me metabolic pathways and so if you are unable to utilize glucose in the nervous system, it's a bad, it's a, it's a bad problem. The other proposed mechanism is the um, induction or the release of what are called excitatory neurotransmitters. These, these are hormones, uh, excuse me, neurotransmitters in the nervous system that drive the neurons to fire and fire and fire, and they literally get exhausted by overfiring. In other words, you just, you just keep having these excitatory uh, neu uh, neurotransmitters, these amino acids, and there's no quiet, there's no reprieve, there's no rest time, and that leads to um, a loss of function over time from atrophy. Inhibition of long-term potentiation. Long-term potentiation is, the, is a very important mechanism for the uh, initiation and storage of memory. And so, uh, hypercortisolism inhibits that ability to store memory, uh, and there, there, there lies the reason why the memory problems uh, uh, are a big feature. And then neurogenesis, decreased neurogenesis. It used to be thought that nerve cells were not, they didn't regenerate in the central nervous system, but we know now that that's not, uh, that's true, that's not true, and the ability to form new connections and new cells is inhibited to a great extent 
by the um, hypocortisolism. There's a relationship between the duration of exposure, the longer you're exposed to it, the higher the levels um, uh, of, of cortisol, the worse the, the problem gets. Um, it and it doesn't take very long to get the ball rolling. A couple of months, two to three, three months, four, five, six months, by that time, the changes have begun. So imagine, if you will, someone who was misdiagnosed, undiagnosed, or underdiagnosed for years on end, which is not uncommon, as I'm sure you, you know. The average time to diagnosis is, is about eight years. So um, if you have unrestricted uh, cortisol exposure for that duration of time, um, it, does, it does put a fair amount of stress on the, on the central nervous system. And by that time, certainly by six months, you've started to see changes in the brain and the hippocampus, and the atrophy has kicked into, into play. So, um, and this is supported by uh, animal studies as well as um, the clinical ex experience. So, um, let's move on and talk about the cardiovascular manifestations. Again, this is all uh, traceable back to the issue of too much cortisol and um, the typical appearance and the typical features that are associated with this are the so-called meta meta metabolic syndrome. And what that is is the visceral obesity, which is, or truncal obesity, sometimes it's described as that, it's in the abdomen for uh, the central portion of the, of the anatomy. Uh, you get that and you get hypertension, <coughs> high blood pressure, uh, and uh, the elevated uh, fasting glucose, inability to use insulin, um, and the dyslipidemia, the odd changes that you find in the lipoproteins in the blood. All of this then results in, again, the insulin resistance. In other words, you're not able to, you're not able to use insulin the way it was designed to be used. The diabetes, impaired glucose tolerance, pretty much the same thing. The atherosclerosis or the hardening of the arteries, the, the deposition of lipid and, and those kinds of materials into the intima of the blood vessels. Um, coronary artery disease from narrowing of the blood vessels, the uh, increased likelihood that you get a heart attack, ischemia to the blood, blood vessels that supply the heart, which could then lead over time to congestive heart failure. And in the blood vessels that supply the brain, the same atherosclerosis and the atheromas can lead to microvascular changes. Uh, in other words, in the small vessels that supply deep inside the brain uh, and sometimes strokes, unfortunately. Uh, as a result uh, of this and other manifestations, the mortality, as you know, uh, for the unrestricted, untreated Cushing's is uh, twice that in the general population as a whole from, of course, the, the morbidities that we talked about, strokes, the myocardial infarction, the uncontrolled diabetes. And diabetes itself uh, is a vasculopathy. In other words, diabetes itself causes vascular changes in the uh, blood vessels that supply uh, the organs, the eyes, the, the brain, and so forth. And the increased likelihood uh, of infections as a result of immunosuppression of, uh, from cortisol excess. Um, now, <clears throat> why do you get the, the, the cardiovascular risk? Well, the heart itself takes a big hit in terms of the, uh, the thickness of the heart. You get a, what's called a concentric hypertrophy. And what that causes is um, much more stress in the wall of the heart. Uh, and the there's an imbalance between the blood supply and the muscle mass. So th th that, leads to that, uh, that leads to the, the changes that you see, the left ventricular hypertrophy, the left side of the heart gets thickened and the demands of the heart uh, increase. Uh, the, it needs more blood, needs more oxygen. And if there's a mismatch with that, then of course that predisposes to myocardial infarction and uh, hypertension. The atherosclerosis, <coughs> Uh, obviously contributes to the uh, systemic hypertension and the coronary artery disease. Uh, narrowing of the blood vessels means that you need more pressure to drive blood through, the, through that vessel and uh, the more likelihood that that vessel, if it does narrow, uh, will result in ischemia or lack of blood supply to the organs that are supplied. The other thing that happens as a result of the cardiovascular changes is an, an increased propensity to clot. 
uh, inside the blood vessels. As you know, there's always a balance in the, in, the, in, in the body between clotting and lysis of clot, clotting and lysis of clot. And so the idea is to keep, you want to have enough blood flowing so that you don't have a clot, but you don't want to have too much blood flowing that if you need to stop the bleeding, stop bleeding, for example, you can do so. So the body is always in a, in a, in a balance between clot formation and clot lysis, clot formation and clot lysis. With hypercortisolism, the equation, the balance is shifted towards clot formation as opposed to clot lysis. So clot lysis is, in, is inhibited and clot formation is increased, which explains why there's an increased risk of thromboembolic phenomena, deep venous thrombosis, and pulmonary embolus in patients with Cushing's uh, um, before and around the time of, of, of surgery, for example. And um, so thromboembolic events are very common as a result of these cardiovascular changes. Now, <coughs> what that looks, this is a neat cartoon uh, which summarizes what I was talking about. Uh, the hypercortisolism, of course, causes the metabolic syndrome, uh, which has those components we talked about, increased uh, thrombotic state, with the cardiovascular risk factors, coronary artery disease and hypertension, strokes. And then the left ventricular hypertrophy puts a lot of stress on the heart. The demands, the metabolic demands of the heart go up. Hypertension uh, is, is, is exacerbated as a result of thickness, increased thickness of the wall of the heart. And then the blood vessels that actually supply the kidneys, the brain and, and, and those kind, and the retina, those kinds of things also undergo significant changes leading to um, loss of uh, function of those particular organs. Um, it, the good news, um, there's always a silver lining to every cloud. Um, if the patient goes into complete remission, some of these things gen tend to get better in the right direction. So, for example, in the case of the heart, uh, the cardiac remodeling that we see uh, over time, not days or weeks, but months or years, uh, the heart may overall overall get smaller, the thickness gets less, and, and becomes closer to normal. The morbidity as a result of the cardiovascular changes gets better, but doesn't return to baseline, uh, baseline meaning a normal person. Uh, mortality can also go down, of course, if the uh, risk factors and, and the uh, treatment uh, is long-term, the remission is sustained. Uh, the mortality curves go down. Uh, but if there's residual disease, of course, or recurrent disease, of course, that mortality curve goes back up. Um, in terms of the brain, uh, you can actually see this on MRI scan when patients come back a year, two, three, four down the line with um, follow-up MRI scans. And what you see <coughs> is a re reversal or improvement in that shrinkage that you saw on the MRI scan. It, it become, those gyri become plumper and less atrophic and less shrinkage is seen. And the patients will actually report uh, improvements in those kinds of things like memory, executive function, uh, the neuroses, the anxiety, um, and depression, and uh, mood stability begins to, to show up. Um, not perfect, but much better than it used to be as a result of the decrease in the cortisol levels. Um, the younger patients do better than the older patients, not, uh, not surprisingly, because we all get some memory changes as we get older anyway. There is some shrinkage anyway as we all get older, so it's not surprising that the older patients do less better at the recovery and the remission than, and than the younger patients. So um, to summarize, uh, still a difficult disease to treat, uh, for multiple reasons, including uh, not the least of which are the cerebrovascular and the brain effects which we just discussed. Um, no question but that the best thing is to induce long-term remission uh, because that's the only way to reverse these changes. And the only way to do that, uh, at least today, is complete surgical remission of the, of the uh, resection of the, of the lesion that's causing the problem, i.e. the adenoma. And um, if we do that, and we succeed in doing that, we can get, in some cases, some complete reversal of some of those problems. In many, many, if not complete, uh, at least a substantial partial reversal. So 
I will conclude with that and I will seg into the next topic. I wanted to just um, do, spend a couple of minutes. Yesterday we were talking about, um, um, Dr. Neiman was talking about this, the concept of, of, of the uh, resection of the, of the microadenomas. In other words, the removal and how the technique of the removal um, obviously has significant bearing on the outcome of the surgery. And so this, this um, illustration that you see there, that cartoon, is from Dr. Jules Hardy's uh, paper. In Dr. Jules Hardy, um, still alive, um, he lives in Montreal, trained in, in, in Paris with another neurosurgeon called Gerard Gio. And th this instrument that you see there, um, let's see if I can find it. See this instrument there, it's called an enucleator. And what it is is that it actually en removes the tumor. See the tumor here, and this is the tumor interface with the gland here. And that's the gland, and you can see the tumor there. Notice that there's no suction in there. What he's doing is he is enucleating, in other words, it's a surgical term to mean surrounding, surround, and, and, and encompass the lesion. And this is a hematoxylin eosin stain. And you don't have to worry what hematoxylin eosin, but those of you who are biologists may know that it's a stain that allows you to stain s nuclei and cytoplasm of cells. And you can see that there's, in this particular case, it's a cross section. This is the adenoma here. And you don't need me to tell you, but can you see a border between this and this? Okay, yeah, so it's there, it's not fake. So this, is, this border here is, I'll show you another one in a minute. This border here is made of, of reticulin, and it basically surrounds this adenoma and allows the surgeon, if he's careful or she's careful, to come along that border and remove the lesion. And if you do that, you'll do what's called a selective adenomectomy. In other words, you remove the, t the tumor uh, selectively. So, and it's called the tumor pseudocapsule. So here's what, this is a case from, oh, I don't know, I think it was in the mid-90s or something, late, late, mid-90s, late 90s. It's a, it's a pediatric Cushing's case. Uh, this child was nine years at the time. And so, this is being done with the microscope, and I want you to pay attention. You can see this lesion here. Can you see that little dot there, little area there, and the anterior superior? This is the gland. This is the brain up here. Brain stem is here. This is the sinus, the behind the nose where we go through. That's why it's called the transphenoidal. And so this is the gland. It's a little tiny thing, and it's maybe, oh, 13 millimeters. So an inch is 2.5 centimeters, which is 25 centimeters, 25 millimeters. So half of 25 is what, 12.5? So, so this is all about half an inch of this space here. So that, that microadenoma is sitting right here, and this is being opened here. You're this would be like you're looking at this area head on. And right here, this little nodule is the tumor. You can't tell right now, I mean, I can, but. <laughs> but, and this little margin here is that margin between this and that. So the idea is to come and not stick your probe in here and, you know, go in there. The idea is to find what that plane is and then, and then remove it. So I'll show you what that video looks like. I guess I won't show that then. <laughs> it's actually, my computer is actually frozen. Need some, 
technical help. Somehow the other is not working. It's supposed to work. Just double click on that, the one on the far left. Yeah, that one. Can you play it outside of Firefox? Mm -hmm. Okay, that'll be fine. Huh? Well, that, everything we're clicking, he's making a duplicate version of this. You can probably just play outside of PowerPoint. I can go to the original outside of PowerPoint. <laughs> Did it let you play it? Yeah. It's here. It's right here. Select. Okay, just click select. Okay, let me try. Let me do something. All right. I'll try one more thing. I'm going to skip that one because we couldn't get it to come up. So this is a different video, and um, in this particular video, the tumor is on the left side, okay? So we're looking at the face of the gland here, and um, if you just sort of cast your mind carefully in this corner there, you can see that this left side is more looking like red, beefy, and this looks a little paler, doesn't it? And right there, there's a, there's a cleft between this little guy and this guy. This guy here is the gland, and this up here is the adenoma. So once you've decided where that cleft is, all you have to do is beginning to gently work around it, right? Like you're trying to enucleate it, right? You're trying to get around it, and what you're trying to do is to separate it through a natural plane. Notice I didn't make an incision there. All I did was move one, one to one side and the other to the other side. And then down here, we're doing the same thing. Up here, you can see just a faint area there. It's called this arachnoid. That's the border between the pituitary and the, and the brain. And you'll see right here, we're coming right again with that instrument called an enucleator. And this is a small, tiny, uh, um, we call it a round blade. But, and you can see this looks beefy, red, and that looks paler white. And there's a little nodule part of this thing that is embedded right back here. And we're trying to work that out and remove it. So you can see that that comes out as a nodule. See that little nodule? And then if you measure it, you can see it's about whatever it is, five or six millimeters. So that's a selective adenomectomy. Um, here's another, oops. Let me show you one other case now. Here's another one. This is another microadenoma. This is a, a patient with Cushing's as well. And you can barely see the lesion. And here's the cella. This is the, what's called the dura. We're just opening the dura. That's the covering over the gland. And we're teeing it back. And this is a little cotton ball. And what that is trying to do is to dab the area so that it stays dry so we can see. And then once you do that, you move, move the the uh, cotton aside so you can actually see. And all here we're just stripping a little thin rim of capsule of the normal gland. And you can see embedded in that little teensy place, right underneath is this little tiny, tiny thing. It's only about three or four millimeters. And you can see like a little pea, right? 
sitting right there, and we're just going around it. This is a little piece of cotton to keep the area dry so I can see. And you can see that little nodule there, right there in the top right-hand corner. And then we're using that little thing to pop it out, yeah? And you see how it pops out. And then there we go. Okay, and that's, you know, again, three or four millimeters uh, size of, uh, of the adenoma. So, um, it depends what you're trying to do. Um, a micro can be harder than any macro in the world, or vice versa. It all depends. Um, so, with that, I will rest my case, take any questions. <laughs> I'm sorry about the technical. Sorry about, sorry about the technical glitches. It, it never fails to happen. There's always some technical. Any questions or? to do that. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, um, <coughs> did you say herniation? So Chiari's or Bain tonsillar herniation are quite common in the general population. Uh, so you, you, not everybody that has the little herniation has the full-blown Chiari syndrome. And there's a spectrum between herniation, um, which is a few millimeters down below the, the skull, to full-blown Chiari. So it's entirely possible that one could have both a Cushing's and a Chiari. Um, and obviously the Chiari could lead to raised intracranial pressure too because, you know, if the CSF is not circulating, you can get that. And sometimes Chiaris are associated with hydrocephalus on their own. Um, I have not seen um, Cushing's per se cause brain herniation or cerebral edema or brain edema, swelling, that's what it is. In fact, it quite causes the opposite, doesn't it? It causes atrophy and shrinkage of the brain. So effectively, you have less brain volume. If you have less brain volume, chances are that the pressure overall is lower because less blood supply and less and more CSF. So I haven't seen C Cushing's do that, but it's quite possible you could have two disorders. There's nothing illegal about that. <laughs> right, right. You bet. Yes. So you were talking a little bit <coughs> about how the reversal, like ten percent of the cerebral atrophy. I'm twenty. I want to go to bad school. Is there anything that we can do to promote that the reversal? Yes. Yes. Good question. Um, that's based on you know those studies, and um, it may be that some people have better luck. You know, twenty percent reversal or. What, what have you. Uh, like everything else, um, it's like a muscle, um, you, you know, you use it. Um, and that, you know, so you use your brain and, you know, and you do math problems and read books and that sort of thing. Um, and you use different parts of your brains uh, at different times. And it's not always crossword puzzles. It's music one day and crossword puzzles the next. 
map the other book, and whatever. So using being active mentally certainly helps the, 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 the function. Um, but I don't know of any pill or something, a medical treatment per se that's being prescribed that causes that. But in the dementia literature, obviously there are treatments that are being tried for dementia. I don't know of any of those being tried for um, Cushing's per se myself. about uh, the difference between microscopic and endoscopic uh, techniques for the pituitary surgery? Good question. <laughs> um, so the difference between... The straight answer is that there are two different viewing tools, right? So in order for the surgeon to do surgery deep inside the brain like that, you've got to see. You need to be able to see and you need light because that place is dark. There's not, you can't see, light doesn't get back there. So you need something that's got light, lots of light. You need something that can um, um, illuminate as well as magnify. So make things look a little bit bigger, right? Because we're in a small space, that helps. So the microscope does both. It illuminates and magnifies, as does the um, endoscope. And so both are viewing tools. They're slightly different, okay? So the microscope, um, a surgical microscope typically has binocular um, um, apertures where the surgeon can look through directly into where he or she is working and um, that allows him to, uh, to, to do the, the work. The endoscope typically has one uh, lens. It's usually what's called a rod lens so it's about that long and it goes into one nostril. And typically it has one viewing eye as opposed to two viewing eyes with the microscope. So the major difference is, is just that. One has two viewing eyes and one has one viewing eye. Both have light and both can magnify a little bit. The microscope has, and the endoscope. It turns out the endoscope was actually used first, right? My, the endoscope was actually used first, decades and decades and decades and decades ago. And then um, the microscope came into, into vogue and was the primary viewing tool for many, many years. And then the endoscope underwent a resurgence and now it's being used again. Uh, it's actually rising in popularity. Aside from the fact that they have two viewing in, in the two viewing eyes of the microscope and the endoscope. What's really important is that that allows you in the microscope to have what's called stereopsis. Stereopsis means 3D, three dimensional, stereo dimension. So that two eyes. And it turns out that, the, that, that stereopsis is very important in the visual system. It's, you know, it took millennia of evolution, uh, years of evolution for us to develop stereopsis. So it's actually a very important uh, thing. It allows you to distinguish depth uh, and size and relationships, um, and it improves eye-hand coordination. So if you're working with one eye as opposed to both eyes, that's the major difference. Um, now, there are 3D endoscopes so that allow you to have that additional um, virtue that the microscope has. So now we have 3D endoscopes which have that ability for you to see in stereopsis with the, with the endoscope. So um, there are some other things that people have talked about and, and in the literature is whether or not one or the other is better in terms of outcomes. Um, I will say it depends on what the surgeon is doing, the particular type of tumor and what the surgeon is comfortable with. Um, there are other things that are described as, you know, as differences in terms of pain, no difference in pain, or length of stay and cost and those kinds of things which are uh, more open to debate. But from the standpoint of strict comparison in terms of technology, uh, the underlying difference is just that. Yes. Um. I'm thinking to myself, though, once I get to the appointment and I look at the cardiologist and I right. say, I was a Cushing's, I've probably had Cushing's around seven years, 
now I'm doing a little less efficient. There's some things I want to talk to you about. About then is when my brain will go blank. And I will be searching for words yeah. that I can't find. And I'll tell them Cushing's and they'll go, uh-huh. And then there's a chance. I need, I need to know words or phrases mm -hmm. that I can help that doctor along with. Like, what, what kind of things do I want that doctor? What kind of tests do I want that doctor to look for? Because like you said, in the medical community, I might be that doctor's only Cushing patient. And so what can I say to that doctor when I walk into that door and I've never met them and my brain completely agrees with me? Right. What, what are some questions I can ask them? What could what the test have asked? Right. Well, I know I'm saying that. Right, right but it. that's yeah. what I was wondering. Yeah. I mean, I, it's... Was there a slide? Yeah, so you could ask for a neurocognitive evaluation. All the elements, um, the, you know, the executive function, the memory, and so forth. And they could track that, and if, if you're seeing the same doctor over and over again, then they can track improvements um, over time um, until things, you know, the improvement stabilizes, and then at that point, you know, you've, you've reach the plateau in terms of improvement. So if you, if, you, if you do that, then you can track the deficit and you can track the improvements subsequent to treatment or during treatment. And then when, till you get to what's called a plateau. In other words, no getting worse, not getting any better, just about the same. And so the, well, the cardiologist, the same thing. They would do their, their bit, so if there was, you know, cardiac problems, they would look at maybe an echo, they may look at cardiac function in other ways with, uh, with um, coronary angiograms, if it was warranted, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, if um, that a good cardiologist would would know the kinds of tests to do, um, one would think, <laughs> right? And uh, the you know, high measuring your blood pressure is a fundamental test. You know, an echo is a fundamental test. Uh, uh, EKG, the thickening, and that you can an echo, you can pick that up. Yeah. Yes. They've been unsuccessful. Yeah. You continue to have obviously elevated cortisol, and you're of a certain age, over 50. Is there anything that you can do to improve cardiovascular health other than you know the obvious? Um, I'm sure there is. Uh, I think the, I'm not a cardiologist, obviously, but. Um, I think, I think if you're still, so two questions. If you're still um, not in remission, I would think that would be the first thing to do would be to get a handle on, my, on cortisol hyper secretion in some way, medical treatment, whatever, because that's the direct cause, right? So until that goes away, you know, everything else sort of, you know, is still a, a problem. So I would say the first thing to do would be to get that under control in some way. That would take away the main driver for the problem. And then, of course, th ways to improve cardiovascular health, obviously control of blood pressure, exercise, diet, et cetera, et cetera, and so on, and things that, more things than the cardiologist could tell you. But fundamentally, based on these, the studies, is, you know, these things persist as long as the disease persists. So until, you, until and unless you go into remission, the main driver continues to, to be there, right? So when I had Cushing's and thereafter, my 
cardiologist told me that I had like fatty tissue around my heart walls or something like that that mm -hmm. had mm -hmm. um, And now I've been in remission for um, some time. And does that mean that it reversed, or should I be like paying attention to that? Well. Yeah, the data, the, the data for cardiac enlargement, hypertrophy, wall thickness, <coughs> uh, to my read, says that those things improve when you go into remission. Um, and visceral fat, you know, the so-called metabolic syndrome, the tronchal obesity that comes with Cushing, um, and fat in all around organs, such as the heart, the liver, and those kinds of things, are related to that, too. Those get better. Um, so I, I would think that that would improve. Based not I don't know to what extent, whether it's 100%, but the improvement is certainly the, the, the norm. Thank you. Did you find remission if you're, uh, after adrenaline, if you go into adrenaline, for a year or whatever after, after the after surgery. After surgery, yes. Um, does remission then start after you clean up the, the steroids, or does it start? Remission can be right the day after surgery, I mean, or two days after surgery. So, so when, you know, if you, your cortisol levels, let's say, post-surgery are 0.9 or something, or 1, that's the definition of remission. Now, what you're talking about, long-term, that's sort of short, so, you, so remission has been induced, then it goes on for a while, then it becomes long-term remission. But effectively, at the time that the, the, the remission is induced, that's remission. So, you know, in some patients, for some patients, it's 48 hours after surgery, they're in a, <coughs> acute surgical remission. Now, the question is, do they stay in long term remission, years and years and years and years. Oh, I'm sorry. This was mentioned very briefly, very quickly yesterday. Um, so, as an effect of my son's surgery, he was 17 at the time, so it's been five years. Right. His body's not producing human blood levels. Not. So, he's not. So, he takes daily injections. He started that, I think, about two years ago. So, in reference to the brain and cardiovascular recovery, where does that come into play? Because he's 6'3", like, when I think of human growth hormone, I think of height, like, the, the outside visible. Um, this is, I'm concerned about the internal cardiovascular, because I understand human growth hormone greatly affects the cardiovascular system and metabolism. Like, I don't know if this is and it sounds like he reached his high potential. Um, so I think it, it everything has to be carefully evaluated to see to see what's going on, whether the need for growth hormone replacement is still there, and then how does that interplay with the other hormone deficiencies he has. Um, it so they're they're actually stimulating him to see if he can make growth hormone because the the etiology of this to begin with is that cortisol inhibits growth hormone secretion and production. So when you reduce the excess growth uh, cortisol, you oftentimes see improvement in growth hormone function. Now, the main reason why he would need it long term was if he had a near total hypophysectomy, meaning that most of his pituitary gland had been removed. So that can happen, or injured. So a very large tumor, a very extensive surgical exploration may do that. But the, uh, I would say the majority, the vast majority of people with microadenomas who are growth hormone deficient at the initial type of surgery regain growth hormone function with time. And uh, since growth hormone's major visual um, result, as you say, is height, and he certainly attained normal height, um, it does have other functions for the rest of the body, but even people who have primary growth hormone deficiency 
alone, we don't treat all adults long term because some of them just don't have a whole lot of improvement in anything we can measure. And why take the risk of taking something and the cost, or the risk to your pocketbook as well as your health, their health, um, if you don't really need it. So it, it, it's um, the transition time between adolescence or childhood and adulthood is a, a good time. What, where he is right now is a good time to re, really reassess. And there are lots of different ways to measure growth hormone function. So it, I would make sure I go to somebody who's used to doing this. Gelatinous, what like it, my tumor was gelatinous yeah. after they and they said it was a little trickier. What is that? Does that <laughs> mean anything? <laughs> well, you know, if it's gelatinous or or, or very soupy, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's kind of what they use. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the consistency may not be uniform completely all around. So there may be areas of it that are soft and more gelatinous or soupy or even semi-liquid semi sometimes, partially cystic. And so then there may be areas around that that are more firmer and more tenacious and more rigid, if you will. And so if you have that variation in consistency, then it's, it's, it can be a little, quote, trickier, right? Okay. Because certain areas are not easier to remove because you know the, you, if you put too much pressure on the, on the lesion, you might get interruption of the of the membrane, that pseudocapsule we talked about. So are they more concerned about those excess cells being left over? Yes, yes, okay. you could have, so if you, if you, for some reason, ruptured the pseudocapsule, then those cells dissipate out there, and then <clears throat> getting the rest of the uh, margin becomes more difficult because the, the, the tumor has lost its turgidity, right, and so that, makes it diff more difficult sometimes to re resect it. And, you know, let's say you had a four millimeter lesion and you took out 3.7 millimeters, you've got 0.3 millimeters left, and one day, maybe not tomorrow, but one day that is going to come back and, and rear its ugly head again. So 98% is not good enough. 99% is not good. So in 100%. my, like in my one year, fo you know, MRI follow up, they didn't see anything. My levels have all been great. So is oh, that, well, is well that your levels are great and yeah. they don't see anything. I would take the levels first and then don't see anything second as good, good, okay. good, um, a good sign. Okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At least, yeah. One more. Is it necessary to get a brain MRI every year after successful removal of a pituitary adenoma? Now, do you mean all pituitary adenomas or just a specific kind? Because there are different ways of managing different adenomas and depending on what was accomplished at the surgery and what you're following. So you remember we're talking about stratification yesterday, not all of the same, but let's assume for the sake of argument that you're referring to Cushing's disease yes. with a microadenoma, patients yes. in biochemical remission, clinically doing well. Shall we agree yes. on that? Yes. Okay. So if we have those parameters, then what we do, and what I think is a, not an unreasonable strategy, is we have the patient annually get biochemical parameters like you heard yesterday, the 24-hour UFC, the AM fasting cortisol, the salivary cortisol, et cetera, et cetera. So that establishes a biochemical basis for follow-up so that if things go out of line, you can detect it there. In terms of the MRI monitoring, once the, if the MRI is negative, in other words, it's clean and there's nothing there and there's nothing else you're worried about in the brain, then we have the MRI scans done every year for the first five years. And then after five years, then we go to alternative years. But the biochemical analysis continues on an annual basis. And if something happens and some, we see something on the MRI, you know, on toward, of course, we can investigate it further. But the biochemistry and the MRI go in, in hand in hand because long before an MRI alters or becomes visible that there's a recurrent microadenoma, the biochemistry will change. Okay, so I guess the answer is after every year for the first five years, definitely. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
along, yeah, so along those lines, if your biochemistry is stable, right, and, and a recurrence would show up there first, then why would you need the MRI yeah. in addition to that? So it is possible, it's not unknown, to have changes on the MRI before detection. So it's not, I mean, you could, you could have a regrowth of, an, of, a, of a tumor before something is detectable. It, uh, I mean, or you could have another adenoma. What's to, who's to say that? Um, so those, for those two reasons, certainly I would say post-surgery, just to make certain that there's nothing growing there that hasn't been detected in some other way, um, because every test is fallible, right? So, I mean, no, no test is perfect. Yeah. Well, I think that's our last one more. One more question. Yes. If, if you have a, a, let me see, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so if you had your uh, tumor removed, but it wasn't through the pseudocapsule, the way that my neurosurgeon described it was cutting it like a book. Mm -hmm. He said it was going to cut it like that. So it, then, then obviously he's let other cells out when he did Well, it's okay to let, let the cells out. If you let all the cells out, that's fine. I mean, if you get 100% of the cells one way or the other, that's fine too. The, the, so there's nothing wrong in getting all the cells out. In fact, that's the purpose whether you do it that way or the other way. But it's just that it's more, much more likely that you get all the cells out if you go around the surgical pseudocapsule. Right. Does that so make sense? It does. So if you have a reoccurrence, mm -hmm. which now I'm more concerned I'm going to have a reoccurrence, it would probably be important that I find a surgeon who will do it pseudocapsule. Is that correct? Um, Y yes, um, um, I, th I, I think that would be a safe answer for sure. Now, it may be that the reason why the surgeon made several incisions is because the lesion was not visible on the surface, or maybe the MRI was negative, and he had to do what's called an exploration of the gland. So if you're going to explore the gland, in order to explore the gland, you have to make an incision in it. And so when you make the first incision, He'll probe deeper and deeper and deeper until he finds something suspicious. And if he doesn't find something at the first incision, they'll make a second incision. And then probe deeper and deeper and deeper until something looks abnormal if he does. And if he doesn't find it on the second incision, why? He'll do the third and so on and so forth. So in your case, just reading through the, the, the between the lines from what you said, I suspect, was your MRI negative? At before going to surgery, uh, or equivocal, yeah, not. Yeah. Oh, he found it. Yeah. Oh, then that's good. <laughs> <laughs> found the tumor and took it out. That's a good thing. Yeah. So as long as you take all the tumor out, that's all that. That's the most important thing, and leave the gland alone, even more uh, as important too. Okay. Good, thank you. Thank you.